Tonight, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce co-authors William Bratton and Zachary Tuman discussing Collaborate or Perish, Reaching Across Boundaries in a Networked World with WBUR's David Boweri. William Bratton is chairman of Kroll, the world's leading risk consulting company, providing a broad range of services to help clients reduce risk, solve problems, and capitalize on opportunities. He's, no, he's also known as one of America's premier police chiefs, the only person to have led two of the largest police forces in the country in New York and LA. As chief of the New York City Transit Police, Boston Police Commissioner, New York City Police Commissioner, and chief of the LAPD, Mr. Bratton revitalized police morale and cut crime significantly in all four posts. In 2009, he was recognized by Queen Elizabeth with the honorary title of Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire. He's a native of Dorchester and holds the Boston PD's highest award for valor. Zachary Tuman is a senior researcher at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and is well known for his work uh, leading research initiatives, teaching senior executives, and addressing organizations in keynotes and panels around the world. He's the author of numerous teaching cases, working papers, reports, and essays. I'm also so pleased to introduce David Boweri moderating tonight's talk. David Boweri is a senior reporter for BUR, uh, Boston's NPR news station. He has received countless journalism awards over the years, including the distinction as Boston's best political reporter. We're very pleased to bring this distinguished panel to the Brattle tonight. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speakers. Thank you for coming, everyone. Looking forward to discussion uh, on Collaborate or Perish tonight. It's a, uh, it's a fascinating book that's just chock full of examples of stories and anecdotes of applications of it. It's uh, interesting today that uh, Mayor Kevin White, of course, was, was laid to rest, buried. And uh, Chris, Christopher Lydon had, had mentioned something to me yesterday that uh, back in the day, it was everything to be mayor of the city, more important to be, to be mayor than to be governor, that it was all here. And of course, Kevin White gets the recognition of being the transformational mayor that brought Boston out of the sort of the Middle Ages into modernity. And of course, you were there. The two of you were there today. You, uh, you know Kevin White? You knew him well? Mm -hmm. you, you, I wonder if you, Bill Bratton, if you'd uh, talk about collaboration in the context of Mayor Kevin White? Sure, my experience with uh, uh, Mayor White, uh, he was celebrated today for his uh, leadership. He was a transformational leader. And one of the things that he did was to surround himself with very young talent, whiz kids, as they were called, whiz kids and girls. And uh, many of them went on to future careers where they were able to have significant impact in a wide variety of professions. I was privileged to be uh, one of those whiz kids. At the age of 32, after 10 years in the Boston Police Department, I was chosen by uh, the mayor and the then police commissioner, Joe Jordan, to be promoted from the position of lieutenant to superintendent in chief. And effectively, I was the ranking uniformed officer of the Boston Police Department at age 32. Every other superintendent in the department was uh, in his 50s or 60s at that time. So that was a great leap of faith on the part of the mayor and the police commissioner to entrust the Boston Police Department and its leadership to this uh, young kid from Dorchester. During my brief time, I, uh, almost three years uh, before I left the department in 1983, I was there during the Traeger two and a half era where we had to close 25% uh, of the stations in the city, lay off 25% of the police officers. I was there to deal with the Globe Spotlight series on corruption, uh, to implement neighborhood policing some 15 years before community policing came into vogue. That was my remembrance of Mayor White, uh, that I was privileged to be one of the many 
that he picked and chose to help him lead the city of Boston from really the dark ages into one of the leading cities in America, embracing change and creating change. It's, it's something about leadership we can talk about more and, and how he extended leadership and to, to the, the whiz kids, the go-go kids That's right. that he brought into government. Zach Tillman, you were, we were talking earlier about uh, one of the uh, crises in, in Mayor White's tenure in which, in which he showed a particular, uh, what, a, what you might call it a, uh, certainly a bold form of collaboration. Well, it was an important time, a time of the, of the Martin Luther King assassination. Cities in America were in turmoil, Boston no exception. Uh, Kevin White um, uh, uh, joined uh, James Brown uh, in concert on a stage. Um, it was truly a moment of collaboration, bravery as well, uh, in a very turbulent time, uh, reaching across significant boundaries, Boston riven by racial and ethnic divide for many years. And here was Kevin White embracing uh, uh, the great soul singer of America, uh, James Brown, um, with the message, let's come together. It was quite, quite an evening. So to the book, to the book, we, we've come to associate you, Bill Bratton, with bold titles to your, to your books, America's Top Cop, <laughs> and now Collaborate or Perish. Is it really that dire? It really is. That uh, One of the things that Zach and I try to do in the book is emphasize the importance of collaboration, and particularly in the 21st century with the new world that we're all part of, the network world, the world where uh, earlier today, Zach and I were talking, and Zach pointed out that Facebook this year will probably surpass one billion people on Facebook. Talk about a platform where people can come together, share ideas, and respond to individual leadership. It will, it, I, I love the line that if it were a country, it would be the third largest country in the world. So how our day-to-day -day lives have been changed, the ability, you can imagine, to go online and reach potentially a billion people. And so the idea of collaboration is more essential than it ever was. My success and successes and failures, uh, as we worked on this book, it was quite clear were all based on successful collaborations. And when I was not successful, particularly my relationship with Mayor Giuliani, it was as a result of a failure to collaborate. So I certainly perished from New York uh, when I had my, <laughs> my, my contratops with Mayor Giuliani, so I'm the living example of success, and I'm also the living example of failure. But this is collaboration in, 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 in a different context. It's collaboration in the context of social media. Zach, you're said to be the inspiration for this book and I wonder if you coined this phrase, it's an interesting phrase, and I want you to explain it, collabonomics. So, so what, what is collabon, what is there, what is collabonomics, and what is there about it that is motivating collaboration? Well, collabonomics is a way of uh, speaking about the forces that make collaboration either more possible or less possible. It's a shortening of the, uh, of a, it's a, the political economy of collaboration. Um, in collaboration, um, collaboration has to pay. Collaboration has to be possible. Uh, and Bill will be sharing some examples of the eight steps uh, to successful collaboration uh, in a moment. But, but collabonomics is about bringing all those things together. When the collabonomics are right, collaboration happens. When the collabonomics are wrong, it's harder. You talk about, though, the, the, the numbers, staggering numbers, this Facebook data. Do you remember what, there's something like 800, was it 800 million? Today, 800 million, and soon, soon, soon a billion. And so because, because of social media, the, 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 the stakes to collaboration, you're saying, are higher. I'm sure that uh, a case in point, uh, Occupy Wall Street, an organization that celebrates its uh, lack of leaders or lack of identified leaders, that organization and its impact on the country could not have occurred without social networking such as Facebook. The idea that a person or several persons, as still yet actually unidentified, had the idea to, let's go occupy Wall Street, got on the web, interacted with some of their people, then interacted with others, and very quickly, several thousand people show up in Wall Street, but more importantly, around the country, hundreds 
of Occupy Wall Street events began to occur. In the old days, absent the news media, TV, radio, newspapers covering it, it would not have had any chance of spreading as quickly as it did. In some respects, it's the social media networks have created the opportunity to Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point to tip the epidemic to become an epidemic so quickly. And the idea of it is that uh, we talk about the eight elements of an essential collaboration. Number one is a leader with a vision. Well, any one of you in this audience can get on that device, I guarantee that every one of you have, in your pocket, and basically pop out with an idea that you share with friends. If they like it, they share it with others. And before you get home tonight, you may in fact be spreading an idea that uh, basically starts morphing and multiplying very quickly. That was Occupy Wall Street. That's what happened with it. Let's talk about it from the, uh, the other side of the coin. Uh, Kroll, you're the CEO of Kroll Associates. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Kroll Associates. Uh, you're looking at, you've been brought in by UCAL Davis because of an incident that we all saw on video that shocked the university. I think it shocked California. It seemed outrageous in which Occupy, uh, some of the Occupy protesters were sprayed with pepper spray. Is this an example of lack of co collaboration among, amongst the police? Well, coincidentally, uh, I have a team that's out there, as we speak, presenting uh, uh, findings to the task force that's been organized to look into what happened on that day, communications, collaboration, so it could be deemed uh, a potential example of uh, failure to communicate. One of my, many of you in the audience probably remember the movie Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman where he plays a prisoner in a southern chain gang and he keeps trying to escape in a one very famous scene on the top of a levee. He's now been brought back after being captured for the umpteenth time and the, the warden slaps him across the face and he rolls down the hill and then the warden says to the mass of prisoners at the bottom of the hill, uh, and that delightful southern accent. What we have here is a failure to communicate. Well, basically, I changed the word. We have a failure to collaborate. And uh, effectively, that uh, the idea is collaboration, if you think of it, now that you've heard the word tonight and heard it repeated many times, I can guarantee there's not going to be a day going forward that you're not going to see it, read about it, or hear about it. It's, it's that essential to the world we're in today. A number of your problems as, that you've had to deal with as a police commissioner uh, have had to do with collaboration, though, haven't they? And what I find interesting is it, we're seeing some of, the, uh, some of the things that have happened in New York because the Occupy protesters have certainly sparked. They, 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 have, they, have, they have sparked this interaction that, that has, uh, has surprised many people. But in New York, it was the white shirts more than the blue shirts that seem to be involved in some of these episodes that were filmed by protesters. What he's referring to, white shirts are in the Los, excuse me, New York City Police Department, are senior officers, usually lieutenants and above, blue shirts being the sergeants and rank and file, and that some of the more significant, noteworthy, publicized incidents, like University of California at Davis, involve superior officers being filmed uh, uh, in uh, seemingly egregious actions against uh, protesters, and in some respects that could be seen as a failure of collaboration within the ranks of, in this case, the New York City Police Department, the idea being that uh, you don't certainly want to have the department seen as being uh, uh, incompetent, inefficient, or, or certainly brutal in the handling of these demonstrations. But uh, my career, I think, Boston, New York, and LA in particular, and the management and leadership of those departments. In the book, we talk extensively about those experiences and how the eight elements of um, collaboration that we've identified, the essential elements, how each of those elements applies to the New York and Los Angeles experience. And that in the New York experience, uh, number seven of the eight uh, elements stay in the political headlights, meaning basically in an environment where you need political support, that you have to keep that political support because if you lose it, you're out. And so certainly in New York, I lost the support of the mayor. And despite success in the other seven elements, reducing crime, inspiring the department, uh, repositioning it, 
I was gone and the success continued, but it had a new collaborator who was my successor. Mm. You've always been big on statistics, statistics to evaluate performance. And we see a lot of that in the, in the book, but this is, this is how CompStat came to be, yes? That's correct. That uh, When Zach had the idea for the book, one of the things he was familiar with, we had worked together in New York on a collaborative project. He was head of the school police in New York, and I was brought in by him as a consultant to work on the reorganization. So he was very familiar with the CompStat system, which was the system we had developed in the NYPD to effectively focus on crime. And the vision and the leadership I brought, Mayor Giuliani brought, we were able to bring others into the picture who supported the idea that something could be done by the New York City Police Department about crime. And the platform that we created to get more and more people onto the same page, if you will, was CompStat. CompStat was a system where the 75 precinct commanders would come together to talk about crime. What are they doing that's working? Where are their failures? Where are their successes? And the idea was that in the CompStat process, there was something in it for everybody, another one of the eight points, in the sense of the opportunity to be noticed and to be promoted, the opportunity to be part of a winning team. And CompStat, uh, as, as Zach looked at uh, the idea in creating this book and the relevance of me uh, being asked to collaborate with him on the book, uh, it was an essential element. And Zach, I think that was actually one of the, the, the seeds for what uh, you eventually created. And, and, and Zach, the, the key to, to, to CompStat here is that you have measurable, you, you, have, you have goals, and you talk about one of the eight points being to keep reasonable goals, correct? To set reasonable goals. Right size the problem. Right size the problem. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that worked with CompStat. Well, um, um, in, in CompStat uh, policing, the, the, the key to success, there are many keys to success, but um, uh, uh, right-sizing the problem and uh, f identifying what the crime problems were that, uh, that were affecting uh, uh, neighborhoods at the, at the street level. Not big picture uh, stories about um, uh, big trends in the city, but day-to-day -day what officers were facing. One of the, then one of the leadership challenges at, uh, that Bill, uh, Bill and his, his command staff uh, addressed was how to bring uh, strategies that individual officers would invent to deal with the problems that they had back into uh, the department so that others could learn and make it, turn it into a, a learning experience. Um, by right-sizing, they were able to uh, make concrete progress on, uh, on clear problems, feel as though there was, suc there was success, um, uh, delivering value fast to the neighborhoods, uh, sweeping it back up, and then uh, through the process that, uh, that Bill uh, led uh, within the policing in New York, moving it back out to each of the precincts so they could use it. And quantification was important here because largely, apart from the FBI crime statistics, which were, what, quarterly and not terribly thorough, there hadn't been a quantification of, uh, of, of, the, of the problem so that you could see whether, in fact, what you were doing was, was lessening the crime. Exactly. The... Uh use of crime information, significant crime, murders, rapes, robberies, the FBI classifies it as the Uniform Crime Report. There are seven major crime categories. And we report that to the FBI several times a year. They compile it for a national crime report. So every six months, you'll see the headline, crime up in the United States, so it's down. But what we were missing in the 70s and 80s, and all of you in this audience uh, can think back to how bad crime was in the 70s and 80s, seemingly always going up and never going down, was that the collaboration between police and community was not occurring. Because what we, the police, were doing, we were focusing on what we thought was important, what was being measured by the national government, serious crime. But what the public, who we were not collaborating with, who we were not providing input uh, into policing, policing priorities, what they were seeing every day was the deterioration of their neighborhoods being caused by certainly serious crime that they oftentimes were not aware was occurring because the media was not covering it oftentimes because there was so much of it. But what they were seeing every day, the prostitutes working at nighttime, the gangs on the corner, the graffiti, the abandoned cars, that because we were not collaborating, we were failing. 
But in the 90s, we got it right with community policing, which about emphasis on partnership, community working with the police to respond to a vision that we could do something about crime, that we came together as partners. We had a shared platform, the platform, the belief that something could and must be done about crime. We right-sized the problem which, where the police would say, we can't do it all, but you need to tell us what the priorities are so that we have some success in your neighborhood. And as we have success, maybe we might arrive at a tipping point that Malcolm Gladwell talked about. It grew exponentially. If we hit the right combination of collaboration, we can tip it and go the other way. And then it was the idea of keeping uh, it all within the political support and leadership of government. And lastly, to be passionate about it. The eight points of the book, which are in the introduction, it starts with vision and leadership, but it ends also with being passionate in the leadership role that you can do something about it. I certainly was very passionate. I'd like to believe that the idea that cops count, police matter. And it was that that Zach recognized in terms of the idea of the book. And it's a book, basically a book of stories, wonderful stories, business, government, human, uh, human uh, uh, inspiration stories. There's something in it effectively for everybody. And some of them are pretty disturbing. Z Zach, tell us the story about Verizon and 9-11 and Wall Street. Well, uh, it's a disturbing story, um, it's a, uh, as many were that day. Um, the New York Stock Exchange uh, was ready to trade even days after 9-11. Um, they'd gone through extraordinary times trying to uh, get their, uh, uh, their equipment and their backlogs cleared. They were ready to go. They discovered uh, that they had no communications. Um, they could not communicate from the, uh, uh, from the trading floors uh, to, the, uh, to the brokerages because their communications was out. And, as, uh, and it was out because um, uh, the World Trade Towers had collapsed onto the Verizon Central Office uh, and disturbed destroyed uh, communications for, for large swaths of southern Manhattan. Now, it turns out that years before, um, the New York Stock Exchange had made a determination that they uh, didn't need and didn't want uh, to go on to a separate, standalone communication system that they would control. Um, when crisis hit and when the, when the Verizon systems uh, went out, uh, the stock exchange discovered that they couldn't uh, move very quickly to restore. Um, they had to collaborate, but it was difficult. Uh, and it was only as a result of the crisis then that the stock exchange came to realize that they needed to come together. They needed to collaborate among themselves to assure their own destiny, uh, to take it into their hands and to build their own telecom infrastructure for southern Manhattan. Meanwhile, um, uh, uh, Verizon uh, uh, restored service, but it had left the stock exchange dark for four days, the longest time since the Great Depression with the global economy on pause, uh, uh, there was a risk of a global financial meltdown, and um, uh, the consequences could have been disastrous. But what, what you pointed out there was that each different company had uh, an incompatible, help me out with this, it, it, mm -hmm. an incompatible interface. You need, with you need to talk, Zach, about the uh, Con Ed and they have conduit versus what Verizon wanted to do. That's the heart, the heart of the story. Well, the. Uh, the um, Imagine uh, th tens of thousands of individual phone systems and individual kinds of connections all um, uh, finding their way into a central network. That was the situation that the stock exchange uh, found all of its members, each, everyone pursuing their own uh, best interest but and making their own arrangements using their own systems. When telecom collapsed and it had to be restored, here were thousands of different systems, some so old that no one uh, knew, e knew even who had put them in. And um, uh, to create, to recreate that, uh, the stock exchange had to come together and decided that they were going to now uh, route their systems not through Verizon's conduits, but instead a single set of connections uh, through Con Ed's. Con Ed was the only other conduit provider in New York, and Con Ed um, uh, told the New York Stock Exchange, uh, "We'll put your uh, wires, um, the lowest level in the uh, in the uh, in our concrete. If someone." is going to get to you, they're going to have to get through our uh, electrical service first, and they're not going to do that. Um, so it was, um, it was quite a change for everyone. The, a, a point here was that Verizon was going to reconstruct their conduit using plastic tubing, which, as you can appreciate, when the World Trade Center fell on the plastic tubing, totally collapsed. They were not going to learn from their mistake. They were going to just figure it was a, a once-in-a-thousand-year event 
So the cheapest way was to do plastic tubing again. Con Ed, its wires were encased in concrete many more feet below street level. So it made sense for Stock Exchange to basically put their wires through the more secure concrete wiring and Verizon lost a very significant amount of revenue for failing to collaborate with the Stock Exchange on coming up with a uh, more risk-free solution. They may tell another 9-11 story, sure. and it's my, one of my favorites in the book. That uh, One of the great things about collaborating with Zach, he has this wealth of stories from working over at Harvard, and many of them are in the book, and there's stories about red balloons, weather balloons, and uh, about Alcor, and, but a uh, wonderful woman down in uh, Rio de Janeiro running the school system and how she used Twitter to totally re-energize her teaching workforce. But my favorite story is one about uh, how shortly after 9-11, uh, we were technically invaded uh, by the Cuban Navy uh, successfully, that they uh, penetrated our tight security. Shortly after 9-11, uh, four Cuban military people wanted to defect, and they uh, stole a gunboat, a Cuban gunboat. They were armed. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, they sailed into Key West, into the marina, docked their boat in the marina next to the Coast Guard, where the Coast Guard kept all of their vessels, and for four hours effectively wandered the streets of Key West trying to surrender, trying to basically <laughs> uh, effectively uh, defect. They first went to a, a Marriott or a Hyatt, I think, and the, the desk clerk, three Americans. o'clock in the morning, sees these four characters walking in and uh, the, the uh, Fidel Castro uniforms and throws them out. No room in the inn and doesn't call the police. America's first line of defense, it turned out. <laughs> America's first line of defense. <laughs> but you can imagine, get out, get the hell out, and doesn't call the police. They finally found a policeman, woke him up, and uh, basically surrendered. But this was right after 9-11. And this begins a story of how, as we are now going to try to increase our defenses against external terrorist threats, the Navy, the Coast Guard, the various harbor masters around the country. They refer to boats, ships, vessels. Each one had a different way of describing a boat. But nobody had an ability to track either in harbor, along the shore where the Coast Guard patrols, or on the ocean where the Navy is. Those three entities were not collaborating even in the way they described what they were dealing with, ships, boats, vessels, and how very quickly there was a group that came together with leadership, with vision, to develop a system where they could effectively identify where every ship, vessel, or boat in the world was at any given time. And it's a wonderful story, but it all starts with these four crazy Cubans trying to defect to the United States. It's, it's interesting because both having worked those days after 9-11 uh, and, 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 and watching even now where where uh, there are a number of sting operations. We have one in, in, in Worcester where somebody who's clearly mentally, mentally ill uh, is, is arrested and charged with a plot to bomb uh, the Capitol and the Pentagon. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of wasted time, and yet we get collaboration. The heart of this story, it seems to me, and the failures, we, we have a guy that wants to fly a plane, but he doesn't want to land and he doesn't want to take off, and the, and, and the word doesn't get through. And that, well, that, the, that had to be one of the more stunning examples of the lack of well, collaboration. The 9-11 report clearly identified that failure uh, by law, the CIA not co collaborating with the FBI, and the FBI uh, uh, really failing to collaborate effectively with local law enforcement. It has changed significantly. Where we are is not where we want to be, but it certainly has come a long way since 9-11. A story in terms of to give you, uh, uh, you're all uh, basically book readers, uh, I'm assuming, otherwise you would not be here to talk about a book, that uh, a real life example of a failure to collaborate or you perish. Barnes and Noble, order. Order is now gone. Barnes and Noble is hanging on by its fingernails. But what was the difference between those two major competitors? A few years ago, Barnes and Noble recognized that the platform that it was using to attract readers to hardcover books was changing. Many of its customers, its readers, were now beginning to read online in a variety of electronic ways. 
So they began to develop a way to reach that audience. Borders did not. And effectively, what Barnes & Noble did to be able to compete with Amazon, the Kindle, it developed the Nook. And so the Nook allowed it to have a platform where people who wanted to read books online could, in fact, go to their favorite store, Barnes & Noble. They had customer loyalty. So a Barnes & Noble customer is more apt to buy a book through Nook than to go to Amazon. Border didn't recognize that its platform was changing. It went out of business. Think of the things that are now out of business because they didn't understand that they needed to change their collaborative platform. Tower Records, remember them? Gone. They basically didn't see the iPad coming or the iPod. The Blockbuster Video Store didn't recognize that Netflix and these little uh, kiosks, these red kiosks you see all over the place, were changing the nature of that business. So collaboration of Parish, collaborative Parish with the italic, uh, uh, the exclamation point, if you will, uh, that term Parish is very appropriate. Mm. What's the danger? What's the danger that organi organizations can blind themselves to what's coming because of the push to collaborate that cuts out those lone voices who may not be collaborators. Well, you know, the, um, the fact of the matter is, uh, with all the technology that we have, it still comes down to people. Um, it comes down to, um, uh, uh, to uh, keeping the lines of communication open in, uh, in important ways. When we're all digitally enabled, as we are, uh, then um, the difference is going to be how can those voices surface. Um, it takes effort. In uh, the case of Wells Fargo, for example, Wells Fargo, um, uh, was, uh, the commercial side was led by a guy named Steve Ellis. Steve uh, came uh, to discover that uh, Wells Fargo's uh, wholesale operation was not on the internet, and he was res responsible for the wholesale operation. And it was 2000, and the, um, uh, the bank was, uh, was facing competitors from all around. What Steve did was um, he, uh, he went uh, to, the, to the customer and said, um, what is it that, uh, that you need from us uh, to, go, uh, uh, to, to, be an inter to, to use us on the internet? He discovered the customer didn't yet know because it was all too new. Now, uh, Steve had to go back and create a little internet organization at Wells Fargo, um, one that was ready to hear customers once they moved the first product out. When they got the first product out, uh, the, f the, f the tide of customer sentiment began to cascade in. And what it told Steve, and more importantly, what it told Steve's boss, Dick Kovacevic, at Wells Fargo, was that Wells should make a bet, and the bet should be a billion dollars on moving to the internet. Uh, Steve uh, and, and Dick, in, in, in his interview uh, with me, Dick said, you know, uh, I looked around, and the thing that, uh, that uh, gave me confidence was Steve was listening to the voice of the customer. That told me more than anything that we were good to go. Um, as a result of their invention, two things happened. One, Steve discovered that um, the move to the internet in, involves people more often than not, right? It doesn't mean you lose touch with people. It means you have much more touch with people uh, because you are so expansive, and, and you, have to, you have to accept that and devise ways to bring it in. But second, um, as a result of their fast move to the internet, Wells Fargo went from managing a trillion dollars in transactions uh, in 2000 to over 11 trillion last year. Uh, it's a monumental achievement, um, a move of an iron-bound bank with 200 years or 150 years of tradition, uh, starting with the gold miners of 49, uh, to move to the internet with that speed um, wow. and claiming the market for mm -hmm. itself. You've, you've said, Bill Bratton, you've said that, uh, that it, it, and you write in the book that uh, crises, use crises to advantage. I can't imagine more of a disadvantage than uh, for you to be police commissioner in LA when the May Day melee broke mm -hmm. out, was it what, May 7th, was yeah. it? The uh, term I use is uh, crises is good, that uh, Rahm Emanuel, when he was in the uh, White House chief of staff, used a similar expression. And uh, I'm a great believer, if you don't have a crisis, create one, because you can accelerate the pace of change. And, but in policing, uh, most of the time you don't have to create one, because there's always something in crises. Uh, in 2007, the day after I had my reappointment uh, hearing, which was a love fest, I was going for my second five-year term. There was almost no negatives expressed against me, and I was going to roll into my second five-year term in a, a good way. 
Uh, we had a May Day event of 7,000 peaceful uh, immigrant demonstrators in MacArthur Park. And uh, my police department that I was very proud of and uh, was leading, that uh, my commander on the field that day made an ill-advised uh, decision because some in a crowd, not in the 7,000, but in an adjacent area of the park were throwing rocks and bottles at the police to disperse not only that group, but he pushed that group into the 7,000 peaceful crowd across the street. And uh, for 13 long minutes, over 150 Los Angeles police officers shooting rubber bullets and wielding batons managed to disperse a peaceful audience of 7,000 people who all, whose story was being covered by media from all over Latin America live, including the Walter Cronkite of Latin America who was broadcasting live and was seen on live TV being pushed over by Los Angeles police officers. So uh, that was my day on May 7th that uh, my uh, coronation the night before was short-lived. So there was a crisis. I didn't have to create one. I had one. And it was probably the worst crisis I've ever had in my policing career. And I talk a lot about it in the book that because it, in, it, it's the uh, example of the eight elements of collaboration. I had a media that was incensed because they were the story while they were trying to cover the story. At the height of the uh, immigrant movement issue, particularly in the city of Los Angeles, which was majority Latino with a huge immigrant population. We had alienated them. I had a police force in its union who I was at risk of alienating as I aggressively sought to use that crisis in my continuing effort to reform the police department. And I had a political leadership, political headlights, who were not happy. I had a mayor who was getting off the plane in a Latin American country. And as he was getting off the plane, he was confronted with real-time video of his city and his police force sweeping 7,000 uh, uh, largely Latino residents out of a park. Uh, you can imagine how he felt. And I had a city council that was not happy. I had the ACLU that was not happy. Uh, so that was the crises I faced. And you're going to have to get the book and find out what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Won't talk anymore about that story. <laughs> that was, that's what's known as a tease. What is, what is the danger? Uh, the, not addressed in the book, but the danger uh, some, some people suggest is implicit, uh, sort of a brave new world type danger when you have overwhelming push for collaboration, for groupthink, as, uh, as one writer refers to it. Uh, well, um, uh, the, the, there was a wonderful story in the Times, New York Times, uh, two weekends ago, about the dangers of groupthink and isn't collaboration overrated? Bill and oh, this I, is yeah, this is this is the writer Susan Cain. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. We talked about the need for introverts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, and some of our greatest inventors have been introverts um, and have been um, like orangutans who um, live solo in the jungle, uh, do their thing, come together from now and again in jungle clearings to mate, and then go back to the. Uh, to the jungle to, uh, to continue to do their thing. Um, the great inventors um, have that reputation. But behind every great inventor, there are terrific organizations, um, uh, organizations that scale, that distribute, that convert, the, take the ideas uh, to action. Um, collaboration, uh, nothing that an inventor uh, might do um, can, come to a, can come to be realized without collaboration of extraordinary numbers of talented people. Um, yes, there's in, uh, um, uh, having, having uh, uh, geniuses around is great. Um, most, uh, most inventions don't come from genius. Uh, inventions come incrementally. Um, innovations come by building upon uh, what generations have done. In our story about Alcoa, um, this, is, this is actually, you know, this is, it's interesting because it, it, it illustrates the diversity of stories you have on uh, collaboration, one from dire police uh, situations to Alcoa, where you're talking about injury rates. Well, it's a uh, smorgasbord. Yeah. Take what you like. <laughs> uh, uh, we, have a, uh, we tell the story of Paul O'Neill, a great leader of uh, Alcoa, one of America's aluminum giants that was on its heels uh, for, uh, for a number of years. Uh, and um, O'Neill uh, decided that um, uh, he could 
he knew how to get Alcoa back onto its financial uh, moorings, uh, but it would take an enormous collaboration across Alcoa. And he would have to mobilize everyone uh, to pitch in. And he discovered and believed deeply in, uh, in the notion of safety and workplace safety. And he discovered that um, this very same process that would require the discovery of, um, of, a, uh, of how to make a workplace safe was the same awareness of process that Alcoans could use to figure out how to make Alcoa more efficient, leaner, faster, uh, and the move to market better. It all involved uh, pushing back the challenge to workers and the demand uh, on managers uh, to collaborate, uh, collaborate around making the workplace safe and um, bringing forward discoveries in new processes they could use to save money and time. The result, um, Alcoa went from uh, what was comfortably uh, top third ranking in workplace uh, injuries, which its managers were satisfied with, uh, to close to zero, uh, zero, zero, uh, zero workplace deaths. Uh, um, uh, and it went from financial backwater and, uh, at risk of peril and at risk of, of perishing. Uh, to financial and global leadership in the course of a decade. It was a tremendous achievement. Which, what was interesting is that here you have, it, it, there, was one, there was one commonality I saw. Uh, you're talking about collaboration with the police w w where, where senior command staff want to be informed of homicides when they happen. And all information that's requested to go on up and quickly. And Alcoa was the same, same way. If there's something it's gone wrong, they want to know it. So you expedite the, the flow of information. Well, both, uh, both Bratton and O'Neill um, had the same idea, uh, and that was um, they, were going to have to, um, they were going to have to raise awareness, uh, their own feeling about the importance of awareness of what was going on in the field to a new level among those who would report to them. This is where the issue of leadership and vision and finding others who would share the vision uh, is incorporated with the idea of passion, point eight. In the NYPD, the vision of police doing something about crime, that we must do something about it, that we are capable of doing it, required getting a lot more people to share the vision. There was an expression we use, you can expect what you inspect. And we made it quite clear to the NYPD, myself and my leadership team, that we were passionate about doing something about crime. And we were going to inspect it much more intimately than the previous leadership to the extent that every shooting in the city of New York and in 1994, every shooting involving a victim, there were probably about 6,000 to 7,000 incidents. My number two and number three in the command staff they were going to be paged every time there was a shooting with a victim. So we pushed that down in the organization that at the leadership level, we were going to be that intimate with the levels of violence in the city. So you as a precinct captain, you as a detective squad commander in each of the 75 precincts, you better be aware of every shooting with some degree of intimacy because you didn't want the embarrassment at CompStat of somebody at the tip of the 50,000 person organization having more information about an event that was occurring in your 300 person command. So it was a way of pushing the collaboration down into the organization. Let's, let's go back though, to talk about this, this brave new world scenario. When you have collaboration to the extent where the FBI is now communicating with the CIA, when in fact there was a line before. When collaboration calls for all sorts of monitoring, surveillance, public surveillance that we've never seen before, is, is there a potential danger to collaboration on that level? Oh, certainly, and I think you see currently uh, at the national level concerns about the Patriot Act when it was first enacted and continuing in New York City at this particular time, still front page stories every day, the New York Times going after the NYPD on its efforts to deal with potential terrorist acts, but particularly its activities uh, dealing with the Muslim community or uh, in trying to still control significant crime in the city, uh, its impact on minority community through its stop and frisk policy. Those are examples of collaborative efforts well intended that have the potential 
to erode collaborative cooperation because they're either not properly explained, improperly implemented. So there is that risk, but at the same time, it has to be balanced about the risk of doing nothing, which was effectively what was happening pre-9-11. One of the stories we tell in the book is a Los Angeles story of a Los Angeles police captain shortly after 9-11 recognizing that at the local level, we had almost no information about terrorism because that was left to the federal level. And quite clearly, it was a phenomenal failure at the national level that helped to create the 9-11 event. So he, at the local level, was trying to find a way to become a collaborator with the federal government, to be, find ways to share information. And so we tell the story of the creation of one of the first fusion centers, which is the ultimate form of collaboration to deal with terrorism. There are now 70 some odd of these centers around the country where federal, state, and local officials and homeland security officials are operating highly sensitive uh, centers for the gathering of information and the creation of intelligence so that all of us are looking at the same information through our different perspectives, but with the ultimate goal of ensuring that we have a seamless web where the events of 9-11, where some character comes into a flying school and only wants to learn about taking off and has no interest in landing, well, that that would be uh, deemed in policing as a clue that you might want to investigate, but it was not investigated to the extent that that information was shared with the appropriate officials who might have taken action on that type of information. I would, and I would um, uh, be as concerned uh, about the, the, uh, the challenge of information overload in the, at those times. You know, we have um, extraordinary vast quantities of data that are streaming in. Being able to make sense of them and understand them and understand their meaning is very, very difficult. I mean, you, I've heard time and again stories of network operations centers with um, uh, with uh, executives who are looking at 60 different displays and, um, and, uh, and you know, overwhelmed by, by the information that's and turning and saying to their support and saying, well, what do you think? I mean, it's, you know, it comes, it, comes, it comes down to a set of challenges. These are humans make, trying to make sense and make decisions, often under crisis. And that means that um, the preparation for it and the readiness for it is important to do beforehand. And that means building the, the rules, the regulations. We know the boundaries. We know, the, we know where the, the bright lines are. Um, and we have the processes in place so that when crisis hits, we're not struggling uh, to find the right person or to find the right, the, the right piece of data that's the clue to success. Zach, do we have enough time uh, on the subject of collabonomics to tell the balloon story? Sure. Before we open it up to questions. I wonder, that seems to be, it, 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 it's on the other side and yet uh. terribly uh, indicative of the power of so we open the story with a, uh, uh, we open the book with a marvelous story about a young man named George Hotz. He goes by the Twitter handle GeoHot. George Hotz is a world famous hacker. He's hacked the uh, Apple iPhone. He's hacked the Sony PlayStation. Uh, he has a tremendous following on Twitter at the time, about 50,000, and on hacker bulletin boards around the world. Well, DARPA, the Defense uh, Advanced Research Project Agency, which did invent the internet about 40 years ago, in 2010 don't, wanted to don't tell Al Gore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in 2010 uh, decided it wanted to celebrate uh, for the 40th anniversary of the internet. But it was really interested in, could the internet do, uh, what was the promise of the internet now to really do uh, uh, the kind of uh, crowdsourcing uh, that everyone had talked about? Could, for example, DARPA launch 10 red weather balloons, about eight feet in diameter, anywhere in the United States without telling people where? And on a certain day, challenge um, those who wished uh, to call in uh, the locations of all 10 balloons. Could people form up quickly and do that? Well, um, it turns out that uh, um, with a couple of months advance notice, um, MIT uh, formed up its team at the Media Lab, Georgia Tech formed up its team. They gained all sorts of publicity. They had terrific faculty and talent support and computers. Well, they were ready uh, for the day of the launch. As um, uh, soon, as, soon as DARPA was ready to say, we, they're up, go find them. Well, George Hotz came on this uh, about two days before the event and uh, just decided he was going to put out a, uh, a call to his followers, his Twitter followers, and say, stand by for an announcement. There's a treasure hunt ahead. Um, and um, uh, uh, on Sunday, uh, when DARPA launched the balloons, uh, Hotz tweeted out to his followers, okay, there are 10 red weather balloons out there. Uh, we're gonna go find them, and here's what's going to happen. Um, if I win, um, yeah, I'm gonna give you some of the prize money. It's 40,000 bucks but here's what I'm gonna do for you. 
I'm going to create a new jailbreak for the, for the iPhone, and it's going to be what, I, what, what hackers call untethered. That's to say, <laughs> it's, it's going to be, um, you can just start up your iPhones and use them on any network you want, uh, just like any other cell phone. Of course, Apple's not happy about this. AT&T is not happy about this. But this makes GeoHot a star. It had before, and it did that day. World, uh, word uh, circled around hacker bulletin boards and across Twitter. We have to get together and do this for us, do this for hot GeoHot. Well, for the first, um, uh, I can tell you that um, uh, MIT, as you'd expect, won. Uh, they did, um, the, they did uh, uh, claim the, claim the f were the first to find all 10. Georgia Tech came in a close second. But for the first eight hours or so of the competition, at uh, GeoHot was in the lead uh, with, the most, uh, with the most balloons. It turns out, much to my surprise, it took all of nine hours for across the United States, the locations of all 10 red weather balloons uh, to, be looked, uh, to be named, uh, sitting in parks, uh, off by side roads, uh, in city squares, visible but unnamed. Ten hour, uh, un, uh, uh, really an extraordinary achievement. It shows that the internet, and it showed DARPA that the internet was powerful. Um, and it, it helped overcome all the advantages of education, institutions, organization uh, resources, great minds. Uh, the power of the networks um, uh, uh, was, uh, was potent. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. It starts the book. Do we have any questions from the floor? Took about 10 minutes for questions. I'll just ask you to prepare to repeat your question. Great. A very quiet group. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, my question is for Mr. Bratton. Um, do you think that CompStat policing or broken windows policing played a greater role in reducing crime in New York City? So well, you want to know whether CompStat or broken windows was more effective? And Bill, if you will, why don't you just briefly explain? The it's a great question because it's something that's debated all the time by academics, criminologists, and others as to the great crime decline of the 1990s in New York and around the country, uh, what was the actual cause of it, or what were the influences. Uh, I'm very adamant that the most significant causal influence uh, on crime reduction in New York, certainly, and then subsequently in Los Angeles, and indeed here in Boston, I would argue, was the police in terms of their leadership in attracting many others to them in partnership, the community policing model, and to bring about the crime decline. I think I have a little insight and inside knowledge on that. But the issue of CompStat and its emphasis on use of metrics and tracking crime, uh, reporting of crime information accurately, and rapidly responding to that information, mapping it, using effective tactics, the, if you will, the uh, the visibility of what we were doing across a whole police department uh, and the relentless follow-up as it went down, if it began to come up, to very quickly get in there and push it down again. That was CompStat. But what we had missed in the 70s and 80s, and I alluded to this earlier, was that in policing, we were focused on responding to crime because it was believed that was the best way to deal with crime, improve our response time, increase our numbers of arrests, clear crime after the fact. But we had moved away from the original reason for the creation of police, which was the prevention of crime. Sir Robert Peel, the 1820s, the creation of the British Bobby. And that's what broken windows was all about. Broken windows was what people were experiencing every day in their community. The minor crimes that we, the police, in the 70s and 80s, for a variety of reasons, were not focused on because we didn't think it was important. But because we were not collaborating with our communities effectively, we didn't understand how important it was to people living in neighborhoods who saw their neighborhoods falling apart. And New York City was the most vivid example of it. There was a city, one of the largest in the world, that totally fell apart. You saw it every day, the graffiti-covered trains and all the quality of life incidents the police weren't experiencing. So the secret of what happened in the 90s was we began a collaboration in policing where we still stayed focused and must on the murders, the rapes, and the robberies. But for the first time, and in New York with 38,000 cops, we had the ability to be everywhere all at the same time. We also began to focus on the squeegee pests and the prostitutes and the drug dealers so that within a very short period of time, we were able to change the face of New York where they were gone. 
they're still there, but they're not as active as they were. They're not as visible. And then in L.A., one of the reasons I wanted to go to L.A. was to show that what worked in New York could work in another environment, a very different city with a very different set of problems. So no one element was the major element. It was basically this, much the same as a doctor working on you with a cancer. He focuses on the cancer, but he also deals with a lot of the other minor impacts of cancer that he gives you other medicines for. And if he only focused on the serious cancer that, and neglected all the other things that are going on in your body at the same time, you'd probably still die because the cancer has many other ramifications. That's what was happening in American cities. They were dying as we, the police, were not focusing on the multiplicity of illnesses that the victim, you, the victim, were experiencing. Yes, sir. Oh, oh yes, excuse me, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I can't I'm sorry. We got these I'm spotlights sorry. in that we can hardly see you out there. Mine has been how well it works, and a great surprise for me was Zach's articulation of the eight steps. Because when you see the eight steps, you say, geez, why didn't somebody think of that before? Well, you could say that about any idea. Why didn't somebody think about that 2,000 years ago? Why, why is the internet now in the 21st century finally happened? You know, why, why, why didn't they think about that uh, 2,000 years ago? So it's... Uh, the great surprise for me was how taking these eight steps, when you read your newspaper, when you watch a, uh, a TV show or you see an article about a business event, you apply these eight steps and you say, geez, yeah, that's, what, that's what's going on. That's why that company's succeeding. And a, an example, if I may, of uh, the idea of whether an idea is best coming from one person or a group of people at the bottom the beauty of collaboration, it can occur anywhere, up or down or across. Steve Jobs was probably the ultimate loner. When you think of Apple, you think of Steve Jobs. Can any of you, when you think of Google, name any one of the multiplicity of people who created Google? Not unless you're a Google uh, investor, probably. But Google is an example of the ideas percolating from a group of people with no one of them surfacing as the guy. Facebook is another example where you got the one kid, uh, basically, who uh, uh, is credited with it, but there was also another group of people who, uh, the battle's over who actually can take credit for Facebook. Uh, collaboration can come anywhere in the spectrum. I would say the one thing that I found most, uh, most surprising was across all these stories of collaboration, um, there's a couple of distinguishing features of the leaders involved. Um, the whole idea of collaboration is about sharing power, which makes people very uptight. It's about giving away power. But as Bill demonstrated in New York, it's also about taking back accountability. Uh, and the two go hand in hand. And what I find surprising in all these stories of leadership is that the great leaders are humble. They recognize that they can't go it alone. Um, and they're also uh, op optimistic that together we can do better. Um, Bill set 10% as the goal for crime reduction in New York. Paul O'Neill set an, uh, zero uh, workplace uh, injuries. Perfection as his goal. Uh, they expected better. Uh, and then they created the frameworks and the platforms and the wherewithal and getting the right people in place uh, to make that happen. So for my money, those surprising dimensions of, of humility and optimism as a characteristic of great leaders of our network world um, uh, really came to the fore. I have to credit my friend Steven Spear at MIT for some of these ideas, but it's, uh, they're powerful notions. Mm. Here's time for one last question. Yes, sir. Um, you've talked about you know, collaboration with technology and some stories on collaboration which sounds more like face-to-face. You know, in the collecting the stories and talking, what have you found are the differences when people can sit down together as opposed to when they're working through the computer? Myself, personally, um, I enjoy the face-to-face -face experience. I'm not a real big computer person. I have a computer in my office and I use it for email. That, uh, and I'm lucky I can use it for that. Uh, my collaborations really, I, I, I get turned on by the face-to-face the -face aspects of it. 
But the beauty of collaboration, and particularly in the network world, is that you don't have to be face to face, that you can in fact do it through this huge network. And it's effectively whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, I've been much more comfortable with the, uh, the uh, working with a team that's in a room with me. And, uh, but, you know, that's me. And that's the beauty of what we talk about. There's examples of people who are able to do this. The young woman in uh, 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 Rio de Janeiro who heads up the school system down there, that she was able to interact with her thousands of teachers effectively through Twitter. And that's where she found her comfort zone and her platform. And so we have uh, examples of the face-to-face -face as well as the technology uh, connectivity. I would say the, um, uh, the, one of the things that's true about our time is that it's a boundary age. We're coming out of this an age of huge mainframes and um, automation. Uh, we're moving to digital, very everyone powered and enabled. And different people have different comfort zones, and there's combinations of ways to collaborate. And our story out of Egypt, for example, we tell the story of the, of, uh, of the Arab Spring and how it starts uh, with cell phones in Tunisia in a square as a fruit seller sets himself on fire. And those stories reverberate. Al Jazeera picks them up. Facebook picks them up. And they begin to reverberate around, uh, around the Middle East and the world. Um, and eventually, of course, they then cascade into Egypt and into Cairo. Uh, where the regime facing insurrection uh, of millions of its citizens turns off the, th turns off the internet, uh, turns off Facebook. And you know what happens? People stream into the streets because they can't, they can't sit at a desk and find each other, but they know where, they know where to find them, uh, each other, and it's face to face. Um, there, people will take action, uh, they'll use combinations of both, and it's really one of the remarkable moments of our time uh, as we straddle this, whether it's people figuring out how to use ATM cards, which some people still do, um, or people uh, using uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, and the web uh, to move millions of people to action uh, uh, that they wouldn't otherwise be able to take. Terrific. Bill, Zach, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. We're going to be signing books now.